And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. first came to the faith, I met a man. This man was in the church. He was a good man. This man was probably, I would say definitely, the most kind man that I've ever met in my life. He was a graceful man. He was a preacher as well. And I would have to say, this man was the best preacher that I've ever heard in my life. And you know, when you're young and you're coming up, you wanna emulate the people that you admire, is that right? So often I would try to emulate this good man. This man taught me how to give Bible studies with people. He taught me how to relate to different people and to be sensitive to their needs. Everybody loved this man. In the church, this man was adored. And not only for his kindness, not only because the man could preach powerfully, but he was adored because the man also was a medical missionary. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. He was an incredible medical missionary. People from the church came to him who were sick. People from the world came to him who were sick. And I don't know of anyone that did not receive help from this man. He was an amazing brother, an amazing brother. But now one day, one day, the church had a situation. And in that situation, the church as a whole, primarily speaking about the leadership in that particular church, they were going to make decisions to hold up sin, to guard certain individuals from being, from being dealt with with sin. And so the good man that I was telling you about could not keep silent. And so he spoke up against these things. He spoke up against these things in a very, a very kind way, but a very straight way. And I'm observing all of these things in the church. And remember, I'm just coming in. So I'm watching all of these different things. And I find, brothers and sisters, that once that man stood up and spoke out against sin and upholding sin in the church, the church's continents changed toward the man. And so brothers and sisters, leaders began to talk about the man in a negative way. They even began to talk to me about the man. People were trying to pit people to get on their side. You understand what I'm talking about? And so all of a sudden these things were going on and when the man found out that they were doing these things, he was, a, he was very sad. He was very sad. And so finally, they called a church meeting. And the church meeting was not about dealing with that sin that the man stood up against. 
The church meeting was about dealing with that man for saying something about the sin that was occurring. And all of a sudden, because they've been calling people around, many of the members who adored that man began to turn against that man. And I remember, brothers and sisters, we were sitting down, and the man came up. And none of his arguments were listened to. And it was obvious that the leadership was going to do whatever they wanted to do against the man. And I could not, I could not comprehend it. You know, I'm, I'm just coming in. I'm like, Lord, this man has done so much good for the church, so much good for the world. How are you just going to let this happen, dear God? And then all of a sudden, the man turned and looked at me with a pitiful look, friends. I've never seen this look upon this man before. And it was almost like he was saying to God, Lord, have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten me, dear God? Please, Lord, let me know. Have you forgotten me? Will you leave me out there? Will you pray with me, friends, as we begin? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we go through so much trials in this life. And it seems many times as if we're by ourselves. Have you forgotten us, dear God? Will you leave us, dear Lord? Many times we've had to stand for you. And in many of those times, sometimes it feels like we're by ourselves. Tell us, dear Father, have you forgotten us? Please answer our question. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us begin, friends. What is clothing a symbol of in the scriptures? What is clothing a symbol of in the scriptures? Revelation chapter 19. Revelation what chapter? Revelation chapter 19, looking at verse, beginning with verse 7. And when you're there, let me hear you say amen. Revelation chapter 19, beginning with verse 7. Have you forgotten me? Revelation 7, 19 and verse 7. What is clothing a symbol of in the scriptures? Revelation 19 and verse 7. And when you're there, please say amen again. Amen. The Bible says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come. Who's the lamb, brothers and sisters? Jesus is the lamb. Watch what it says. And his wife hath made herself what? Now, who's the wife? The church is the wife. Now watch this now. The question, what is clothing a symbol of in the scriptures? Notice what it goes on to say. And to her or to the what? To the church was granted that she should be arrayed. What does that word arrayed mean? Clothed. Is that right? I'm going to be asking you questions, so I want you to talk back to me. Amen? I want to make sure you're awake too. So notice what it says. It says, be arrayed in what? Fine linen. Did you get that? Fine linen, brothers and sisters. The church would wear fine linen. Now, it's interesting, friends, that it seems to me that certain clothes that we put on affects our character. Do you realize that? Yeah. I mean, you ever put some nice, fine clothes on and you looked in the mirror in the morning, you was like, man, I look fine today. Watch out now. I look good today. Has that ever happened to you? I look nice today. And so what happens is it puts, it affects the way you think. When you wear a suit on, it gives you some sort of a dignified character for that day. Is that right? Or if you was to put a, 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 a cut up leather jacket, uh, cut up on the sleeves and it had Harley Davidson on it, that would make you act a certain way, make you feel a certain way. Is that right? And so clothing affects your character. And the Bible says that the church here had fine linen on. But let me tell you something. That don't mean anything. 
Because you, be, you, you can be the wickedest person in the world and still look good. Is that right? But this is what matters. Notice what he says. Arrayed in fine linen, clean and what? White. That's what matters, brothers and sisters. Is it clean and is it white? Notice what it goes on to say. For the fine linen is the what? Righteousness of saints. Now everybody has righteousness because everybody got clothes on. So it don't matter because your righteousness, the Bible says in Isaiah 64, that is as filthy rags. Is that right? So what matters is, is if your linen or your fine linen is clean and white. We're not going to go to the other text. Look, therefore, clothing is a symbol of your what? Of your character. Now, if you are attempting to have the character of Jesus Christ, what two ways will Satan use in order to strip you of those clothes? I'm going to ask that question again. If you are attempting to have the character of Jesus Christ, what two ways will Satan use in order to strip you of that character of those clothes? Now watch Genesis 37. Genesis what chapter? 37. Genesis chapter 37. Go there with me to verse 19. Genesis 37, beginning with verse 19. And when you're there, please say amen again. Amen. All right. Genesis 37, beginning with verse 19. The Bible says, and they said one to another, behold, this dreamer cometh. This was Joseph's brethren. Is that right? And they were looking at Joseph. Now notice what it says. Come now, therefore, and let us do what? Slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say, some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Re Now listen, I want you to think about this. What's happening right here? I'm going to come back to it. Notice what it says. And he heard it and said, he would have delivered him out of his hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness and lay no hand upon him that he might rid him out of their hands to deliver to him to his father again. And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren. Notice what happened, friends, that they stripped Joseph of his what? So the first thing they did, friends, was they stripped him of his coat. His coat clothing? What does that represent again? Notice, friends, notice what it says. It said they stripped him of his coat, his coat of many colors, and they took him and cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. We're going to come back to it. But what is the second way? The second way that Satan would want to strip you of your clothing, of, your char of the character of Christ. Notice what it says in Genesis, in Genesis 39. Genesis 39 and verse 12. Genesis 39 and what verse? The Bible says, and she, Potiphar's wife, caught him by his what? His garment. Is that clothing? Caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out, brothers and sisters. Now let's look now. The first way seems to be always persecution. You remember how they came against Joseph? That's the first way. That Satan wants to, how, that Satan uses to strip you of the character of Christ. Listen, the first way seems to be always persecution. Satan has two traps in this first way. The first trap is to get you so scared that you would succumb to the intense pressure of being persecuted. You ever been there before, friends? You ever been there? You were persecuted. Satan, you just, you, you were so scared. And you were, tempt, you were tempted to give in to the temptation because you're scared. That's the first trap that we tried to do. Look, now, do we have an example of this? Well, let's see. John chapter 9. John what chapter? John chapter 9. Do we have an example of this, friends? John chapter 9, beginning with verse, with verse 19, 19. And this is, of course, the story when Jesus healed the man that was born blind. Notice what it says in verse 19. And they asked him, I'm sorry, go to verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight 
until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. Now notice what the parents said. And they asked them, notice what the Jews asked the parents. They asked them saying, is this your son whom ye say was born blind? How then doth now he see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Brothers and sisters, were they lying? Yes, they were. They knew. Notice what he goes on to say. Or who hath opened they, their, his eyes, we know not. Is that the truth? No, friends. Notice, now they're going to throw it right on their own son. Watch what it says. He is of age. Ask him. He shall speak for himself. Now notice what happens next. John now tells on the parents. He tells on them. Notice what he says in verse 22. These words spake his parents. Why, John? Because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age. Ask him. John said, this is why they said that. Because they were afraid. They were afraid. And so, brothers and sisters, many times, we, we, under the intense pressure of persecution, we succumb to the trap. Now, watch this now. The second trap of being persecuted is to make you angry and hate the persecutors. Did you get that, friends? I hope you get in there with me. How many of us been there? People spoke bad about us. People have been mean to us. And then we start, we start spitting out the same type of hate about them because we're angry. We want to be justified. Oh, yes, we, 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 we want to redeem ourselves. How dare you speak to me that way? Brothers and sisters, that's a trap. You know that? Listen. The second trap of being persecuted is to make you angry and hate the persecutors. Satan knows that this trap will strip you of the character of Christ. When you start justifying yourself, brothers and sisters, when you start b b believing, how dare somebody talk to me about that, uh, uh, like that? These people are wicked people. Brothers and sisters, he just caught you in his snare to strip you of the. Let me tell you something. The, you, your character must be fit for heaven. You know that, right? And you cannot, friends, I'm going to say this again. You cannot hate one single person upon the face of this earth. And think you're gonna and think God is gonna open up one of those 12 gates for you. Do you understand that, friends? You must love every single person, and that means the people who hate you. You can know prophecy all you want, but if your character is if, if your character does not fit in the design of prophecy, then brothers and sisters, we're gonna be lost. Listen carefully. Satan knows. That this trap will strip you of the character of Christ. For Jesus was willing to even be killed by his persecutors in order to give them a chance of being saved, brothers and sisters. He was be willing to be killed by the people who, who persecuted him. Why? To give them a chance to be saved. Do you have the same feeling in mind, friends? When people persecute you? Or are you just angry and you just want to talk about them and you want to write articles about them and you want to do videos about them and put them on YouTube? Listen, friends. Is this the key to having a perfect character? Loving somebody that hates you? Is that the key? Anybody want a perfect character? You want that character? Is this the key? Let's look. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew what chapter? Is loving someone that hates you, that persecutes you, the key to having a perfect character? Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, beginning with verse 43. And when you're there, let me hear you say amen. amen. Matthew 5 and verse 43. Notice what it says. Ye have heard, this is Jesus speaking. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and do what to thine enemy? Hate thine enemy, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good. Now, brother and sister, this is the Sermon on the Mount before we go on. You know that, right? This is the most popular sermon in the history of the entire earth. How 
many times, friends, do we act like we don't know what this sermon says? We read it over and over again. As a matter of fact, some of us present truth people, even historic Adventist people, don't read it anymore because we think it's milk. Are you listening to me, brothers and sisters? And we want deep stuff when we don't have this simple stuff, brothers and sisters. Amen. Notice what he goes on to say. He says, uh, but I said you love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. How many of us do that? Oh, we pray. Oh, yeah, we need to pray for them. Why? Because they're so sorry. That's how we, we pray for them. We talk about that with an attitude. With our eyebrows up, yeah, we need to pray for them. We don't really mean it, friends. That's self-righteousness. Listen to what it goes on, goes on to say in verse 45. Why? Why should we do this, Jesus? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publican so? Be ye therefore what? Perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is what? This is the key to having a perfect character, friends. When you love people who hate you, this is it, friends. Did not Jesus go through this? Look, now watch. The second way is to tempt your fleshly nature. That's the second way that Satan uses to strip you of that character, to tempt your fleshly nature. It was a total onslaught on Joseph as Potiphar's wife went after him every day to lie with her. Did you get that? Now let me tell you something. Potiphar's wife was probably one of the finest women in Egypt. Potiphar was a dignitary in Egypt. He's not going to get just anybody to be his wife. Do you know that? She was probably as young as Joseph was, friends. And she was probably looking real good to everybody, friends. And it was this woman that came to Joseph day by day saying, lie with me. Do you know how strong, hard that is for a young man to go through? Every day, brothers and sisters, but Joseph held his integrity in Christ. He stood strong. Is that right? So when all these things were going against him, he stood strong. Listen, and it is a total onslaught on some of us as Satan tempts the fleshly nature by viewing semi or straight up nakedness on the Internet. You listening to me, friends? On the news, viewing it on magazine covers when you're online at the store. Just simply walking down the road, viewing it on television, and the worst one is viewing it in your thoughts when the distractions already listed are not there. How many times, friends, do these things jump in our mind, jump in our hearts? You need to fight that. You know that? We need to fight these things, friends. These are methods of the devil to strip you of the character of Jesus Christ. Now, after... Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife. Did she lie and make it seem like Joseph tried to rape her? Did she do that? Well, let's look at the story. Genesis chapter 39. Genesis what chapter? 39. Genesis chapter 39. Notice what it goes on to say. Genesis chapter 39. After Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife, did she lie and make it seem like Joseph tried to rape her? Genesis chapter 39, beginning with verse 19. And when you're there, say amen. amen. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in an Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass, when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I lifted up my voice and cried, 
that he left his garment, he left his garment with me and fled out. Now, brothers and sisters, do you know it is very, very difficult to dispute those accusations? Even for today, when a woman cries rape, most of society automatically, automatically gives her the sympathy. Do you, do, you, do you believe that? And so brothers and sisters, just the accusation against Joseph was almost like he was guilty, friends, in the eyes of the people. This was real hard. This was real hard for Joseph, friends. He'd been standing up for God all these times being a slave, and now something like this happens. Let's look now. Now, when you have on the clothing of Christ, is receiving, did Joseph have the character of Christ? Did he have those clothes on? Now watch. When you have the, on the clothing of Christ, is receiving false accusations a part of being a Christian in this world? Is it? Well, let's go. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew, back to Matthew chapter 5. Notice what it says. Is this part of, of being a Christian? False accusations against us? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11. When you're there, say amen. Jesus says here in verse 11, blessed are ye when men shall do what? Revile you and what? Persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you. How? Falsely for my sake. Then why are you complaining? He said you're blessed when that happens. Why are we complaining when those things happen? It's part of being a Christian, brothers and sisters. Notice what he goes on to say in verse 12. Rejoice and be what? He's telling us to be the very opposite of what we have been when these things happen. He said Re to be happy. Rejoice. Listen, be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. He's reminding us of the scriptures. They did this to them. You think they're not going to do it to you? You think you're not going to be falsely accused of certain things? Don't be afraid of those accusations. Amen? Amen. Don't be afraid of the devil, brothers and sisters, when you got on the clothes of Christ. Amen. Listen, let me tell you something. When you got on Jesus' garments, Satan is a lion with no teeth and no claws, brothers and sisters. He can't do anything to you. Don't be afraid of these things. Notice what it goes on to say. What kind of punishment did Joseph receive which shows us that Potiphar did not believe his wife? Let's go. Genesis 39. Back to Genesis. Genesis what chapter? 39. Are we learning something this morning? Amen. Amen. Notice what it says. Genesis 39 beginning with verse 19. Genesis 39 and verse 19. And it came to pass... When his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was what? Okay, he was upset now. He was angry now. And notice what he did to show forth his anger. And Joseph's master took him and put him into what? Prison. Back in those days, friends, you did something like that. You tried to rape a, a high dignitary's wife. You think you're going to prison? No, even nowadays, brothers and sisters, you can be lucky if you can escape the wrath of the man. Is that right? Notice what he goes on to say. He says, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. Listen to what the spirit of prophecy says. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 218. Joseph suffered for his integrity. Did you get that? Are you going to suffer for your integrity? You have to expect that, friends. Look. For his tempter revenged herself by accusing him of a foul crime and causing him to be thrust into prison. Had Potiphar believed his wife's charge against Joseph, the young Hebrew would have lost his life. Potiphar didn't believe it. He knew that woman. He knew his wife. He knew she was looking at some other young men too. He knew it, brothers and sisters. And he probably only had her for status purposes. Now, look, let's watch this now. Joseph was innocent. Is that right? He was innocent, brothers and sisters. Look. But he was found guilty of attempting to rape 
a helpless woman? Listen carefully. Satan was trying to destroy his what? Character and his what else? Reputation among the Egyptians. You see, Joseph had a good reputation among the Egyptians. Even though he was a slave, brothers and sisters, when he would do his work, he did his work more diligent than any other slave. Not only that, friends, when Joseph would do his work around the house, he would be singing those hymns that was taught to him by his father Jacob. He was giving praise and honor to God and to Jesus all the time he worked in the field. Everybody knew that Joseph uh, 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 lifted up his God very highly, brothers and sisters. Joseph was a good witness as a slave. Did you hear that? Everybody knew what type of person he was, so Satan was after his reputation. Listen carefully. Not even murder has the power of damaging a person's reputation of character with a lasting effect on society like rape would. That's a serious charge. Even murderers, friends, in jail, when they're in jail and they murdered so many different people, they did all this evil, but when a rapist comes in the jail, everybody in the jail unites and wants to go after that rapist. You ever heard of those things? All of a sudden, the murderers are righteous. It's something about rape when you take control of a helpless person that causes indignation to rise up in man, even wicked men. And even in society, if you was to do this thing and then get released from jail and go out into the world, well, now your name is marked. Everywhere you go, you're on some a registry. You're on a, what was it called? The uh, a sex offending registry. Everywhere you move, it has to be known publicly that you are there. You are embarrassed for the rest of your life. Rape has a lasting effect on society. And this is what the devil was trying to do against Joseph. Now watch this now. Quote, but the modesty and uprightness that had uniformly characterized his conduct were what? Proof of his innocence. Did you get that? So even though this charge was against him, the Egyptian says, no, no, no. I know Joseph and I know her. I know her and I know Joseph. We don't believe him. And that's how we have that. That's the kind of character we need to have, friends. Look. And yet, watch this now. To save the reputation of his master's house, he was a man to disgrace and bondage. Joseph, friends. Stood up for God in so many different ways. And now it seems as if he was left out there, friends. Look, when Joseph went to prison, how was he treated at first? How was he treated? Psalm 105. How was he treated? Psalm 105. Psalm 105. When he went to prison, friends, how was he treated at first? Psalm 105, looking at verse 17. And when you're there, please say amen. The Bible says, he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Why would God specifically say this? Brothers and sisters, it must have been some mark pain that Joseph went through in his feet. But the word of God had to spell it out for us. Joseph was hurt, friends. They must have did something with his feet when they laid him in that iron. And Joseph must have agonized in pain, friends. He must have been in pain and he must have been crying out to God, Lord, why is this happening to me? I stood up for you. Why? Look, friends. Joseph must have been devastated. He must have thought on how he stood up for God when Potiphar's wife approached him and he said, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph might have felt abandoned by God. The cry from his heart to the Lord must have been, have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten me? But what was God's purpose now in letting Joseph be punished 
for something he did not do. I, I want you to get that now. Joseph was punished for something he did not do. What was God's purpose of allowing him to be punished for something he did not do? See, some of us brothers and sisters, we're going to be punished for something we did not do. Oh, we're ready to raise up. I want justice. I want that. But what did Joseph do? He went through it, friend. What was God's purpose? Notice what it says. Psalm 105 and verse 18. 18 and 19. Whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him, friends. The word. Of, listen, friends, look. This is the same reason why it happens to you. That's why you're punished. For things you didn't even do. Because God is trying you, brothers and sisters. Will you despise the, 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 the trying or the chastening of God? He's trying us, friends. He's going to, you have to understand, he's going to allow this thing to happen to us. How are you going to respond? Let's look. Now, when Joseph steadfastly trusted in God and passed this trial, what did God trust Joseph to do? So Joseph showed that he trusted in God, went past the trial, even though he was punished for something that he did not do. And because of that, what did God trust Joseph to do? Watch this now. Psalm 105, 20 through 22. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go what? Free. And not only that, he made him lord of his house and ruler over all his substance, to bind at his to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom because Joseph endured that trial of being persecuted and in loving the persecutors God could now trust him to be a ruler in the kingdom friends that's the only way Jesus is going to be able to trust you to be a ruler in his kingdom you know that right he says if you're faithful you're going to be ruler over much is that right but friends, you got to go through the trial of Joseph first. You got to prove that you, you can love people in the midst of them hating you. Or you ain't ruling nothing. Look. So just like Joseph, why else would God sometimes allow us to be punished by those who hate us? In other words, what is another reason for this? We know it's to fit our characters for the kingdom, but what's another reason for this, friends? Look, Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Genesis what chapter? Chapter 50 and what verse? Verse 20. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. So just like Joseph, why else would God sometimes allow us to be punished by those who hate us? Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Are we there? Amen. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. How, Joseph? To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. That's the reason. God wants you to be a witness many times. Did you remember reading about the martyrs, friends? How they were innocent and they were punished? Even though they knew they were innocent, being burnt alive, did they spit out hate, hate, hateful language to the people who were persecuting them? Did they do that? No. Like, did Stephen do that when he was being stoned? No, brothers and sisters, no. They spit out only love and only admiration to God, friends. And because of those faithful witnesses, many people gave their hearts to Christ. Do you know when we are so willing to justify ourselves and not be not allow ourselves to be persecuted? We are we, we are not allowing God to save a soul that's in our midst. Did you get that, friends? We're thinking about self so much. And that we're not allowing God to work through us that somebody may be impressed. Is this is what that man Jesus is about? Wow. And be impressed by that. Because we, gotta be, we need justice. Look, friends. Jesus brought seven years of plenty in the land of Egypt. Now we're going to get to something else now. Jesus brought seven years of plenty in the land of Egypt. And then seven years of what? Famine. famine. Even other nations suffered because of the famine. 
This was truly a crisis for the world, friends. Pharaoh elevated Joseph to a position for the saving of the nation, but it would ultimately be to the saving of the world. Could this also be an end time scenario before the mark of the beast goes into effect by law? Could the story of Joseph give lessons for us living just before the last crisis comes upon the world? Could that be true? Let us examine this by asking this first question. Now we're going to begin the sermon. That was my introduction. Let's go. You ready? Now, watch. Look. Where did Joseph plant food during the seven plenteous years? Where did he plant food? We're going to have the scriptures up here. We're going to go pretty quick. Where did Joseph plant food for the... So remember, first he had to be persecuted. First he had to exemplify the character of Christ in the persecution, love his persecutors before God can exalt him and make him ruler. Is that right? Now he made him ruler. Let's look. So where did he plant food? Let's look. Genesis 41, 46 through 48. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by what? Handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. The food of the field, which was round about every city, he laid up in the same. In other words, wherever Joseph found a patch of grass. Even if it was in cities, friends, or surrounded by concrete or whatever they used, uh, brick back in those days, friends, he planted food. He was planting food everywhere. Are you listening to me? Now watch this now. How much food did he gather? How much food did he gather? And Joseph gathered corn as the what? Sand of the sea. Very much until he was left numbering, for it was without number. Watch this now. Look. Did Joseph keep food only for himself and the Egyptians? Did he? Well, let's see. Look. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries. Did you get that? How many countries? I hope you're getting this. The whole world came to Joseph for food, friends. Listen. And all the countries came unto Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn because that the famine was sore in all lands, friends. All nations came unto Joseph. Watch this now. Okay, here's the question now. Are Seventh-day Adventists to be an antitype to Joseph? Are Seventh-day Adventists to be an antitype for Joseph? Watch this now. Spirit of prophecy, look. This is Testimony for the Church, Volume 6. Watch this now. Every institution established. Now, notice what it said. Every institution. Did you get that? That means your churches, your publishing houses, your whatever, your sanitariums. Every institution established by Seventh-day Adventists is to be to the world what Joseph was in Egypt, brothers and sisters. Did you get that? The whole world came to Joseph for food. The whole world should come to us for spiritual food, friends. Are you listening to me, friends? But guess what? You got to make your institution that way. And that's why we're here. We're trying to come together, brothers and sisters, as ministries, as workers of the Lord, to make this happen. That's what this weekend is about, friends. Not just about you hearing good preaching. It's about carrying this message all the way through, friends. Listen, every institution established by Seventh-day Adventists is to be to the world what Joseph was in Egypt and what Daniel and his fellows were in Babylon. Oh, we got a special calling, brothers and sisters. Do you hear that? That's why we need to come together and do this thing. So Joseph was a Seventh-day Adventist. So watch this now. Now, who was it actually that sold the food to the people of the land? Who was it actually that did it? Genesis 42 and verse 6. And Joseph, the Seventh-day Adventist, was the governor over the land. And he it was that sold to all the people of the land. It was Joseph, the Seventh-day Adventist, that actually sold it. He actually came up with the plan 
on, on, on growing the food. He came up with the plan on storing the food. And it was Joseph, the Seventh-day Adventist, that actually sold to the world. And all the world were attracted to Joseph, the Seventh-day Adventist. But not just him, friends. It was, and I mean, not just the world came to Joseph, but you know who else came to Joseph? Notice what it says. And Joseph's brethren came. What is that? That was the Seventh-day Adventists that were not prepared for the crisis. Even they came to Joseph, the Seventh-day Adventist, brothers and sisters, and bowed down themselves before him and their faces to the earth. Now, what kind of currency proved to have true intrinsic value during this crisis? Let's see. Let's see. Genesis 47. And there was no bread in all the land. For the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the what? Money. Why? Because they they, 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 he, they, people were buying the corn. All the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the corn which they brought. And Joseph brought the money into who? Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh represented the government. So he brought the money into the government's house, Pharaoh's house. Watch this now. And when money failed in the land of Egypt, friends, did you get that? When there was no more money left, when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, give us what? Bread. Bread. So what kind of currency had true intrinsic value during this crisis? Food, friends. Is that right? Food, friends. Look, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. Look, friends. What indication, listen carefully to this. What indication do we have that many of the Egyptians lived in the country, friends, but were not prepared for the crisis? What indication do we have that? Well, let's see. Let's look. Watch what it says. It says, and Joseph said, give your what? Cattle. And I will give you for your cattle if money does what? Fail. And they brought their what? Cattle unto Joseph. So all the Egyptians brought their cattle to Joseph. Watch this now. And Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for all the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. Now, brothers and sisters, would you have, do you think they had horses and flocks and cattle in the cities? What do you think they had them at? In the country. These were Egyptians who lived in the country but were not prepared for the crisis. It's like some of us. We move out to the country, brothers and sisters, and all we have in front of our house are, are, are beautifully manicured lawns with no food growing on it. You move out to the country and you do nothing with it. You don't prepare for the crisis. You won't wind up like the Egyptians, brothers and sisters. Now watch this now. What did the Egyptians request of Joseph now that they may have food? What did they ask Joseph for that they may have food? Watch this now. Look, Genesis 47. When that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. My Lord also hath our herds and our what? So Joseph had all their herds and their cattle, which now belonged to Pharaoh, the government. Is that right? Now watch. That our money is spent. Okay, he says, there is not aught left in the sight of my Lord, but our what? Bodies in our lands. Listen carefully. Wherefore shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our what? Land by us and our land for what? Did you see how deceived they are? By us and our land for bread. The Egyptians did not think, friends, that the land was the source of the bread. Did you get that, friends? So they said, by our land for bread. You see what happens how you think when you're in a crisis? When you're not prepared? Look, it says, and we and in our land will be servants unto Pharaoh, 
and give us seed that we may live and not die for the land that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for the government, for Pharaoh. And this was fine in Joseph's time, but in the end time scenario, this ain't good, friends. Look, so Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians sold every man his field. Why? Because the famine prevailed over them, so the land became the government's or Pharaoh. Now watch this now, look. The people now, watch this, friends, acts for their own enslavement. Do you see that? They asked for their own enslavement. The government owned the people's land by way of the people requesting it. Pharaoh did not twist their arms. They're the ones that requested it because of the crisis. They panicked, friends. It says, it says, by the way of the people requesting it because of their what? Their need. This will be the mindset of those in the United States when they request for the mark of the beast to be passed by law. Food was the means of controlling this situation and food will be the means of controlling the people of the United States when according to Revelation 13, a no buy, no sell decree will be attached to the law of the mark of the beast, friends. This is it, friends. Now, all the land of the people now belong to Pharaoh or the government. Where did Pharaoh or the government place the people now? They took all their land now. Where did they place them? Let's see. And as for the people, he removed them into what? Cities from one end of the borders of Egypt even to the other end thereof. Pharaoh said, get off my land. It's my land now. Watch. Look, friends. The cities here were used as concentration camps. The government owned all the land in the private sector at the people's request. This means that the government owned most of the land in the nation. These are traits of a communistic style government where the government now owns the food, they own the land, they own everything. Look, what makes this even worse is that because the people were not prepared for the crisis, they actually requested it and welcomed it, friends. Listen. The anti-typical application of what occurred in Egypt is now developing in the United States of America. You see, the government is not basically your enemy. It's not the congressman and, 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 and the president and all those things. You know what it is? Is the people who believe in Jesus, so-called, and they, what they're gonna do is, they're gonna go to the government and push them and request a mark, the mark of the beast, brothers and sisters. And many in the government are not going to want to do it. But they're going to be asking for their own enslavement. So instead of our sermons being geared to destroying the government, brothers and sisters, it be, should be geared in trying to save some of those Protestant denominations, brothers and sisters. So they won't be caught up in this stuff. We know some of them will. But we got we to gotta call get God's people out of that foolishness. Are you listening to me, friend? Look, watch this now. What was then given to the Egyptians, and how did they receive it? How did they receive it? Let's look. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is what? Seed for you, and ye shall do what? Sow the land. Did you get that? He bought them. Now he's going to, the government is giving them food or seed. Watch this. Look. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh and four parts shall be your own for seeds of the field and for your food and for them of your, your households and for the food of your little ones. And they said, thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord and we will be the Pharaoh's or government servants, servants, friends. So let's look. All the seeds belong to the government. Did you get that? It all belonged to the government. The government shared these seeds with the people. They gave them food when the people already had the source of the, uh, the, source of the food, but they sold it out because they were not prepared for the crisis. This is an element of a socialistic styled government, friends. 
By the government answering, now listen, I want you to get this now. Listen carefully. By the government answering all the requests of the people for their own enslavement, this gave a sense to the people that they had some say in what the government ought to do. Did you get that? Because every request that they came to the, the Pharaoh about, Pharaoh did not deny them. He gave them anything they wanted. So it gave them a sense that the government was listening to them and they would listen to the people. Whatever the people say, the government would do. Listen, in other words, it gave them a sense that the government was somewhat of a republic. Now listen. So as in Egypt, so in the antitype. The United States, during the time of the crisis of the mark of the beast, will have elements of a communistic, socialist, and republic-style government. The communistic and socialist aspects will be masked by pretended republicanism when the people request for and receive the mark of the beast by law. By this, the people are deceived. They can say, we got America back. They listening to us. The government's giving us whatever we want. Oh, brothers and sisters, they're deceiving themselves. Now, now, now we know how the Egyptians were. Now, let's ask this. How did the Israelites or the Seventh-day Adventists fare during this time? How did they fare during this time? The, Ad the Adventists, let's look. Okay, Genesis 47, 27. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied how? So the Seventh-day Adventists during this crisis were doing pretty well. Did you get that? Now, let's look now. What is one of the reasons why they fared so well? You and I need to know that. Why did the Adventists fare so well during this time? Look what it says. And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are what? Come on, y'all hear that? Say that again. Men are what? Shepherds for their what? Trade had been to do what? Now, brothers and sisters, what is the purpose of a shepherd? A shepherd keeps cattle to help make the ground fertile from the dung of the cattle, that they might grow food that they can eat. They were farmers, brothers and sisters. That's what the purpose of being a shepherd was. They didn't just kill and eat all of those, those animals. It was to make the ground fertile so they could farm the land. And the Bible calls it a trade. Now watch. It says, and they brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, what is your occupation? That ye shall say, thy servants what? Trade. So friends, do you think we need to have trades among us? Watch this now. Thy servants trade had been about cattle from our what? Youth, even until now. That, you know what that means, friends? That means they were masters of their trade because they learned it from when they were small. Look, both we and also our fathers. So it went through generations, friends, that, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. Why? For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. The Egyptians said, we don't like those blue-collar workers. We don't like them. We don't like them people who work and get dirty and all of that stuff. They abomination to us. They keep cattle, stink sheep. Be gone from us. Listen. How did their trade benefit them but hurt the Egyptians who thought such trades were an abomination? How did it hurt the Egyptians? Let's look. Watch. The land, remember this? The land of Egypt is before thee, Pharaoh said. And the best of the land, make thy father and thy brethren to do what? Dwell in the land of where? Goshen, let them dwell. Listen what Pharaoh says now. Notice what Pharaoh said to Joseph, the seventh-day Adventist. And if thou knowest any men of what? You know what that means? Many men who know how to work. That's what it means. Who know how to physically work. If any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. I don't know if you got it, but you're going to get it now. Watch this now. So no, notice, I'm, let, me, let me just come back. Pharaoh said, 
The government said that, Joseph, because you're so good at what you do, if any of your friends among you, I don't even know them, but because of you, I'll give, the, I'll give them whatever you want. And because of you, Joseph, if anybody you know among your people that are good with their hands, that are men of activity, that know some trade, let them rule my cattle. Now watch this now. Remember this? And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. And Joseph said, give your what? Yeah. This the Egyptians have. Look. And I will give you for your cattle if money fail. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph, which gave them to Pharaoh. This was the Egyptians' cattle. And Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for flocks and for the cattle, the horns, and the asses. Now watch this now. Look. The Israelites, or Seventh-day Adventists, were rulers over Pharaoh's cattle. So when the Egyptians sold all of their cattle to Pharaoh for food, who do you think acquired the Egyptians' cattle? The Israelites or the Seventh-day Adventists, brothers and sisters. This made them more, even more prosperous. Why? Because the dung of so much cattle would make the land of Goshen, where the Israelites dwelt, more fertile than any parts of Egypt when the famine was ended. Did you see this, friends? Listen, friends. All this came upon the Egyptians. Why? Because they thought such trades were an abomination. Now, in an end time scenario, what could be an anti-typical application of the priests of Egypt who acquired their food from Pharaoh and did not have to sell their lands? The priests didn't have to sell their lands. Look, and as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Only the land of the priests bought he not. For the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh of the government and did, and, and did, and did eat their portion with Pharaoh or the, that the government gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. Listen carefully. The pagan priests of Egypt could represent Rome or apostate Protestants who are favored by the government. Because, you know, we're not favored by the government. And in almost every government, you ever visited other countries and went to different churches, Seventh-day Adventist churches around the country? Oh, brothers and sisters, if you go to other countries, you'll see that the governments are linked with these churches. Now, watch this now. We should notice that the priests made no negative attacks against Joseph, the Seventh-day Adventist, during this time. Why? This is because all in Egypt, including Pharaoh and the priests, were being fed by God through Joseph, the Seventh-day Adventist. God used him mightily because he was diligent in his what? Trade of farming. We're almost done, friends. We're almost done. Could God use? Let me ask this question here. We're almost done. I'm sorry. Five, yeah, we'll be done in five minutes. Look, could God use Joseph? In this manner, only because he was a very spiritual young man? I'm going to ask that question again. Could God use Joseph in this manner only because he was a very spiritual young man? No. no. Look, listen, remember. That ye shall say, thy servants, what? Trade hath been about cattle from our what? Youth. Now notice what it says in Genesis 37. And he said unto him, I pray you this dream. I pray, I, I pray you. Here I pray you this dream, which I dream. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the what? Joseph would not dream about this, friends, if he didn't really practically do it. Did you get that? It was because he was a diligent worker and he was a spiritual young man. Not just because he was very, because you could be very spiritual and be of no use in the missionary field. Amen? When people need practical help, what you going to do? Quote them a Bible text? They're going to say, make that practical. Well, let me call America and see if I get some funds to help me to get somebody else to pay somebody else to do it. Look, friends, look. All right, we're closing now. As the Israelites of old, should we be creating trades and industries for our people before the mark of the beast Christ? Should we do that? Look, attention should be given to the establishment of various industries so that poor families can do what? Find employment. Carpenters, blacksmiths, and indeed everyone who understands some line of useful labor should feel a responsibility to teach the, and help the ignorant and the unemployed. That's Ministry of Young, page 194. I'm rushing now, but we're going to end. I'm rushing now. Look, 
We're closing now. Friend, you can come up. We can start playing. We're going to close now. Look, Joseph was diligent in his devotion to God. Is that right? Look, Joseph was diligent in his work as a slave and as a free man. Joseph was diligent in industry. In other words, Joseph was faithful in all aspects of life. This is why God could use him to save the world. Therefore, those who would be saved at the end and those whom God would use that he might save the world in the last crisis upon the earth would be found just as faithful as Joseph was, friends. The faith of those who face the mark of the beast crisis will be tried now and when? Then. They may suffer long as Joseph did. The cry from their heart might be, Thou, O Lord, remainest forever. Thy throne from generation to generation. Wherefore, wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? We may feel just like Joseph was, friends, when he was in that prison, brothers and sisters. We may feel just like that. So how would God answer the question, Have you forgotten me? To those who were persecuted and did not hate their persecutors, but remained faithful. To those who were, who, who were lied upon by others, but remained faithful. To those who were tempted by the fleshly nature, but remained faithful. To those who were punished while they were innocent, but remained faithful. To those whose faith was tried to the uttermost, but remained faithful. How would God answer? For the Lord will not. For his great name's sake. Why? Because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. And so the good man, friends, the good man gave that sorrowful look as if to say, Lord, have you forgotten me? And brothers and sisters, the leadership of the church disfellowship the good man. They disfellowshiped him. But the good man went on. He went on and continued doing ministry. And he continued doing the medical missionary work. And many people's lives were blessed. But brothers and sisters, the brethren and the church that once loved that man hated him now. And they began to try and get the government to put accusations against them. You can believe this, the church going to the government to try to get this man to be put in jail. I was young in the faith when I saw this, friends. To put the man in jail. And guess what, friends? They succeeded. And not only that, they made this man look so bad that they took him out of the prison. And you know what they did to the good man? They laid him down on a cross. They laid him down on a cross. And they put spikes through the good man's hand and the good man's feet, brothers and sisters. And they raised the good man up. And all the good man could say or would say was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they did, what they did. And the good man died, brothers and sisters. But you know what? The third day, the good man was risen again. Now, brothers and sisters, because the good man loved his persecutors, because the good man was reviled against, but reviled not again, because the good man did that, brothers and sisters, when he got into his father's kingdom, the father gave him the kingdom. The father said, you can rule now. Why? Because you were faithful when you were persecuted. Now rule this kingdom. Rule the whole thing. Oh, brothers and sisters, I'm not talking about Joseph. I'm talking about Jesus. Oh, yes. Jesus, friends, laid out an example for us. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as we close? Bow your heads and close your eyes. You want to say, Lord? At this camp meeting, I want to receive the, the latter rain. At this camp meeting, I want to be converted. Help me to be like the good man. 
Lord, you want to say, Lord, I acknowledge the times. I acknowledge all those times when I was persecuted and I, and I reviled again. When I was angry with my persecutors, when I hated them just as much as they hated me. You want to say, Lord, forgive me, please. Forgive me, dear God. Help me to love those who hate me. I want that perfect character. I understand that if I do not have that character, then I will not be trusted to preach the eternal gospel to the ends of the earth. I understand that by me recognizing my sins, that is the first step to steps to life. I recognize that, dear God. And so, Lord, I want to ask you to forgive me. And the last question I want you to see is this, friends. Right on the board. Look up here. On the board. Is it your desire to be faithful to God when you're persecuted? To be faithful to God when you're tempted by the fleshly nature. To be faithful to God when you're lied upon. To be faithful to God when you're punished unjustly. And to be faithful to God when your faith is being tried. Now friends, if that's your desire, I want you to come up to the front as we pray together. If that's your desire, I want you to come up. We're going to pray together. Brothers and sisters, we don't want this camp meeting to end without us really. We want it to begin. It's just beginning now. We don't want it to begin on a good start, friends. We want our hearts to be pure. We want to be ready for the crisis to come. We need that character. We need that type of clothing, friends, that will cause us to love somebody that doesn't love us. That's the only way we're going to get through this crisis. You know that, right? You're not going to get through this crisis by just understanding Revelation 13 in its written form. You're going to get it by living Revelation 13. Amen. Do you hear that, brothers and sisters? God wants our characters, friends. It may be someone here. Oh, brothers and sisters, the enemy is at work. There may be someone here. They may believe that I need to be rebaptized. I need to give myself over to God publicly in the waters of in, in the great the grave the, the waters of the grave, brothers and sisters. Somebody needs to do that. I want you to contemplate this. We got to end this service now, but I want you to contemplate this through as we go through this camp meeting. You want to give your heart to God all over again. If you want to do that, this is the right time to do it, friends. While you are convicted of it. Let us, let us make this not just another camp meeting. May we be converted, brothers and sisters. And may we go forward to the last crisis. Please bow your heads with me and kneel as we close in prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive us, Lord. We took a little extra time this morning. We pray that we can get back on track. But Lord, I just don't want to leave until you have convicted someone here of their sins and drawn them to Jesus, the good man. Oh Lord, help us. We need him to be like Joseph was. Naturally, we are totally opposite. Help us, dear Father. Help us to be converted. Help us to love our enemies and help us start by loving each other first. Please, Lord, be with us as we continue on. In Jesus' name we pray.